What's going on, everybody? And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. So today, I'm super excited to have author RS Ford joining me. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go by Rich. So Rich, how you doing today? Very well. How are you? You know, not not bad for a Wednesday. Uh, you know, we're still in a pandemic, unfortunately. But uh, well, that's it. Yeah, you know, day, as we call it over here. Yeah, yeah. we call it that as well. I guess. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, just uh, just turning along, trying to get. You know, a little bit of work done here, a little, little bit of book listening or reading done there, which is, uh, it's, it's going pretty good so far this year. I mean, you know, of course, I've, I've I listened to Engines twice, so <laughs> clearly, clearly I've had a little bit of time, so. That's it. That's a commitment. That's a solid yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, uh, yeah, just want to, you know, just start off like I always do with these chats. Just uh, tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh you know, you know, growing up, did you, did you write a lot growing up? Did you read a lot growing up? And then kind of, how did that, how did that spring the writing bug and really wanting to, to, to write seriously? Um, well, I was, I wasn't a big book reader when I was a kid. I was more, uh, into comics. So, uh, um, 2000 AD, which isn't, which is sort of a, it's a UK staple, but it's not that popular in uh, in the US. Obviously, you'll know Judge Dredd. Yeah. But that's that, that's where Judge Dredd started in, in 2018. So that was a big influence for me. So I used to, I, I did used to sort of make up stories, but I'd, I'd draw the comics when I was about six or seven or eight. Um, so that's where, that, that, that was sort of the first seeds of, of creativity were, were sort of planted. Uh, back then, and then I was then I then I was more into interactive fiction, sort of uh, fighting fantasy books, the choose your own adventure type things. Mm. And so they they that's captured my imagination then between sort of eight and nine up to my early teens. Um, and I, I, one of my earliest ambitions was that all I wanted to do was was write game books. That was it. That's you know, and I. I wrote a few when I was nothing worth reading. Uh, and then beyond that, um, writing was always the, the thing I was best at at school. Mm -hmm. But um, from from that sort of sprung the idea that I might want to be an author, but it always seemed sort of um, an unattainable aspiration. It was never sort of a realistic um so I, so I kind of forgot about it for a while. I still mm. used to read a lot of fantasy. I read, you know, started reading the Dragonlance books and then moved on to the classics, um, sort of Tolkien and that kind of thing. Um, and then read a lot of David Gemmell uh, and a lot of Warhammer fiction as well. So mm. in the early 20s, that's when that sort of started to become really popular. Um, so I, so I, I sort of chanced my arm a little bit and started... You know, went back to that old aspiration and, and wrote a few short stories. And I, my, my first published short was actually a Warhammer uh, short story that appeared in one of their anthologies back in 2006. Okay. We're, we're going back a little bit. <laughs> Dating ourselves a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm aging myself there. Um, and, I, and I wrote, I, I went to write another uh, another three short stories for them, but I never, they, they were never interested in a novel. <laughs> unfortunately um and then then from there um the easiest way to get good at something is to do it so i, I still just started writing writing fiction just for myself really not really with any realistic aspiration of ever being published although i, I always thought it would be nice mm -hmm. um, and then eventually wrote a book sent it to an agent got it published that was cool back in 2011 so that has a potted history of my, <laughs> of my upbringing in the genre. <laughs> I gotcha. So um, you're one of a few author authors that's brought up the choose your own adventure type stories. And it's nothing, it's it's something that I, like I haven't ever read. Like, I've, you know, I've seen them. I've seen, you know, I know they have like some kids books that really aren't like the fantasy types, but you can, you know, read a section and you get to pick where you go next. What are some that you would recommend or if, if you can even remember some of the older ones that you've read? Well, my, my all-time favorite was, um, was Joe Diva's Lone Wolf, which is a 32-book ongoing series. So you wow. probably the throughout 30, 32 books. I had the, I, I met the, I met Joe Diva actually a few years ago when I used to work in I used to work for a small uh, tabletop role-playing game company. I was a 
sort of editor, producer, and sort of wear, wore all sorts of different hats for that company. Um, and we produced the Lone Wolf role playing game. So I met Joe a couple of times and we, we did some special editions of his, of his books. Uh, and I actually wrote one of my earliest attempts at writing a novel was to write a, a, a Lone Wolf novel, which had a rather limited release. Um, it's one of them. <laughs> and it was all right, but it wasn't, it wasn't really of a publishable quality. Mm. Um, and um, so that, so that, yeah, so that to answer your question, that was that was my favourite. But there, there's all sorts. There's way of the Tiger books where you where you're a you're a ninja, um, and some of the old uh, fighting fantasy classics like Death of Dungeon. Um, you know, you can't you can't go wrong with those. I think the reason I liked interactive fiction so much, I think I've probably got a little bit of um, undiagnosed ADD. So when I was younger, reading a full length novel. Was a bit daunting because yeah. I just wouldn't, I just couldn't do it. Um, whereas if you if you play an interactive fiction, you read a little two hundred word passage and then you you decide what happens next, and it was mm. a little dopamine hit that sort of grabbed my attention. So it, in a way that sort of long form fiction never did. Um, obviously, but when I got to about fifteen, sixteen, it was time to start reading grown up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, man. Maybe that's something I should have done. Yeah, I, I think you know when I was growing up, most most of the stuff that I read was like under 150 pages. Like it just, and and even then, it would take me like a, a week to read that much. You know, now yeah. now you know I'd come across like a 600 page book. You know, generally I'll listen to it on audio and I'll finish it like in a day. Like you know I did with Age of Uprising, um, or, or with with Engines of Empire, which is the first book in that series. Uh, yeah, it's you know it's 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 so crazy, but yeah, my my attention can actually stay on something most of the time. Like if I can if I can put my phone to the side or turn it off, because <laughs> that that's yeah, the issue yeah. now. That that's the distraction. It's something I don't even have anything pop up like no notifications or anything. And I still like what what everybody's doing on Twitter. Like <laughs> it's it's, well, it's there's so, so much sad. there's so much other media now to be to be distracted by. Um, and there's so much for, for people to consume, whether it's, you know, whether it's something on Netflix or whether it's a, you know, Candy Crush or whatever it is. Um, when you're writing a book, you're competing against so much other media that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been because, you know, TV was rubbish. There was only four channels and, you know, computer games were in their infancy and not very good. Right. So reading a book was, reading a book was, you know, Pretty much the best thing and the most and the best value for money whereas now you know there's the, you're competing with so much mm. um i think that's why that's why audios sort of improved because it, it turns reading actual reading is quite an active pastime whereas mm. um watching tv and listening to an audio book is much more passive so it's it's easier for you to to sort of just relax and get in the zone whereas reading you, you've got to engage with the, the book yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole like active reading, you know, I have to make sure like I've got like nothing else going on that day. I have no distractions. I go, okay, I'm going to set aside this X amount of time to do this. Whereas like with an audio book, I mean, I can, you know, go do some chores around the house. I can work. I can, you know, pretty much do anything. And nine times out of 10, I've, I'm able to grasp everything that's going on. Now, if it's like, you know, a chunky fantasy book that's got, you know, 15 POVs, it, it might it might be a little more difficult and I'm gonna have to come back around to it. But but yeah, generally like with like thrillers and stuff, like I can I can throw it on like two and a half to three times the speed, get everything that I need to and you know, go off and and, and do what I need to for the day. But yeah, yeah. Or, I think audiobooks do require um, a certain mindset in that you you've got to engage with them. Because if you find if you talk a person whose mind drifts off all over the place, you find that you You've been listening to it for 10 minutes and you've not actually nothing's gone in. Yeah, yeah. I'll rewind it. Um, so but I, I think once you once you get it, once you start to engage with an audiobook, I think I, I it's one of my favorite ways to to consume books, I think, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually talking to some friends yesterday. We're doing a reread of uh, Red Rising. I don't know if you've read Pierce Brown's series. Um, but uh Tindrod Reynolds does the audiobooks. And, uh, you know, he has, a, he has a very distinct cadence as far as, you know, his spoken word versus everybody else that does audiobooks. Um, but I can listen to him like at a, at a pretty high clip because I've kind of developed 
I know exactly how how his words are you know going to be spoken and how he's going to you know, perform each voice and so forth. Uh, and, and you know, but some people just like they just can't they either they can't speed it up, they can't pay attention to it, et cetera. But you know, I've been listening to audiobooks for gosh five six years now, and you know, it's just it kind of comes natural to me to I can turn everything else off and just listen. But there's still yeah. times where like it goes in one ear, not the other. And, <laughs> and I've lost an hour. <laughs> so. I think a, lot, a lot of that is down, down to the, to the narrator. Um, for me, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of um, first person. I like third person. Well, I like the stuff I write. So multi point of view, third person narratives. Mm. Uh, I've found audio books are perfect for first, person, anything in first person. So I, I, there's a lot more books that I would listen to now um, that, that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't read because they're in first person, mm-hmm. uh, which which I always found quite jarring. But but it's perfect for audio because essentially you're listening to a single narrator. Yeah, um, basically telling you a story. So it's it's perfect for that medium. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, as far as uh, you know, you getting into writing and so forth. Who who would you say were some of maybe your big, your bigger influences growing up, and are they still influences today, or would you say that? You've developed some over the years. Um, well, the, obviously, there's a cl- the, the old those old guys that wrote the classic 2008s, so Pat Mills and and those chaps. Um, growing up, what, my first foray into fantasy was the Dragonlance series. So um, Margaret White and Trace Hickman were, were probably they were bigger influences on me than, than Tolkien. Really, I, I I remember reading those books Last before man. I ever. But yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, but you know, you have to take it on the chin. But yeah, um, I think because it, because it was, it wasn't as difficult because when you're 14, 15, Lord of the Rings is quite daunting. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But whereas um, Dragonlance is much more accessible, Dragonlance and the and the Forgotten Realms, the Aris Elvatar books and stuff like that, they were a lot easier to to digest when you when you're a in your mid-teens, as, as are the, you know, Warhammer novels and things like that. Mm-hmm. They're specifically written for that audience. Um, but in many ways, uh, even more blasphemy, I actually prefer prefer them to Tolkien. I prefer them. They're much more fun to read. I, you connect, I connect with the characters more, you know, easier. It's, it, it, it is blasphemy to say it, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm that influenced by, by sort of Tolkien or, C.S. Lewis or any of those. those yeah. I'm sort of influenced by David Gemmell, um, who's, again, he's not, not as big in the States as he, as he is in the UK, but, um, but yeah, he, he was the guy that really sort of, once I'd read the Dragonlance books, that, that was the, the switch to adult fantasy um, for me was 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 David Gemmell. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I enjoy talking. I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh my gosh, you can't, you know, I can't talk to you anymore. Don't you, 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 bad mouth thing to you. I'm not <laughs> criticizing. <laughs> granddaddy. Yeah, it's not, that's not what I intend to do before I start getting hate mail. <laughs> um, but, but no, but you know, yeah. when you, when you say Gimmel, I'm, I'm sure I'll be like, ah, oh, it's safe. Okay. You're, you're good now. You, you've, you've kind of saved yourself a little bit, especially, especially with, you know, the grim dark fandom. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I completely agree. You know, Tolkien, it, it does take, it does take being a little bit, I don't know, like older and wiser in your reading career, I guess you would say, like to be able to really get what he's what he's going for and portraying in some of his books. Cause they're they are pretty, pretty dense reads when you're when you're younger. I mean, you know, I, I think I think I was like, I don't know between 10 and 12 when the movies came out and like as soon as i saw the first movie i was like oh i totally want to go read the books now like oh it's so good and i started reading the book and i go no idea what's going on <laughs> you know and i was like and so i just shelved them and i was like okay thick books are not for me let's stick with let's stick with thin books that i can get through relatively easy I did, before the films before the films came out i was a little bit older than you before the films came out i did do a reread of the of the lord of the rings trilogy mm-hmm. and i still skipped the council of elrond because it's it's so pages of you know people standing around talking yeah uh, which, which you know at the time it was written and, and for the audience at the time is great but um i think think i mean people talk about how literature's moved on and so on. um it really is engaged with different things nowadays mm-hmm. but, I mean, but it's true the 
you know, you could get away with 40 pages of, of um, Hobbits and Elves standing around having a chat about Ring back in the 50s and 60s. And I think you'd struggle to, to replicate that now. I don't think you'd be able to write that and have, and have people, unless, you know, unless you did it in a in a particular way that's that's appealing but uh, yeah. yeah i certainly wouldn't tackle that one yeah yeah it's you know i'd say you know like a lot of authors today like okay you get the point let's go to the next thing you know mm-hmm. whereas i like you know like a tolkien or a jordan it's very descriptive and they have you have to know exactly what's going on and what's placed where and why and who's in what position and who's actually the- it's just it like you said, it's really good for when it was written, and a lot of people still love you know Will of Time and Lord of the Rings, which I mean I, I still do. Uh, but nowadays, you know, it's it's more of a fast pace. You know, okay, we're not going to tell you how they got to this specific spot. We're just going to jump to a different POV that's already there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, like, exactly. Yeah, that for me, that's that's always what I've been interested in. I, I mean, I tried reading Dune as well when I was uh, around the same time, when I was sort of early teens, and that, I was never going to get more than four or five chapters through that because that's dense as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, never, I've never gone back to it. I've, I mean, I watched the movie, I love the movie, but um, I can't see me ever um, reading those old classics again because, um, the, as you said, they were, they were very much of, those t- of their time. And I was never really so this is going to sound odd as well. This is going to sound like blasphemy and, and crazy talk, but I was never really into the old epic fantasy classics. I've, I've never read The Wheel of Time, and I don't think I ever will. Um, read a really small amount of Terry Brooks. Is it Terry Brooks? Yeah. And um, the is the, the Shannara dude. Shannara. Mm-hmm. I, I read the first one of those. Uh, tried reading some Ray Feist, and it, and it's just not me. I'd rather read. You know, I'd rather read an Elmore Leonard or a, you know, Ian Banks or something like that because it's just more easily digestible. It's probably my ADD again coming out. <laughs> I, just, I just haven't got the attention span to wade through 12, 600 page books. Yeah. Series because that, you know, it's, it's just not, it's really daunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I'd much rather, you know, sit down with, a, with an Abercrombie or, uh, you know, uh, I mean, even even right now, I'm I'm still finding it kind of a, a slog to get through uh, Song of Ice and Fire. I'm I'm still trying to get through the fourth book. It's just I'm just kind of like, oh, I still got like eight hours in the audio. I think I can do it. <laughs> um, and even though I love Roy Detrice's narration, and and I, I hate that he's not you know around anymore to be able to do the next book whenever it comes out. Um, you know, it, it, he started like changing names of characters, like the way they were pronounced and stuff. And it kind of throws you a little bit. Uh, and yeah, then of course that, the that way Martin broke jarring. up three and four, uh, or four and five, it just kind of, it's like, come on. <laughs> like it, you it, 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 uh, yeah. It, yeah. Well, I mean, all that, all that said about, him. despite what I've just said about, you know, two huge 600 books, I do love. Trouble Crumb and George R. R. Martin, and I could read them, you know, all day. They could, you know, write the write out the phone book, and I'd, and I'd love to read it. Yeah. So, so that's probably a little bit contradictory of me, but yeah. There, <laughs> it, but it depends on the, it depends on the author's voice. I, again, yeah. I mean, Joe, Joe writes huge, you know, but he, you know, he writes two hundred thousand word novels, um, but the plot bounces along. You, you get lost in the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, Written in a completely different style to the old classics, yeah, um, which which can occasionally sort of be a bit wordy and wander off on a bit of whimsy. Here, and there. you know, you get Bill pops up and he's got absolutely nothing to do with the plot, and it's that sort of right. Why is this even in here? Right. If Tolkien submitted his book now, uh, the editor would just tear it to bits. It'd be about half as long. So. Yeah. Yeah, the times definitely have changed. Absolutely. Well, speak, speaking of writing, uh, can you talk a little bit about your writing process and maybe how it's how it's changed or developed over the years <laughs> since you released your first short story? Um, well, I, I mean, writing short stories is a very different process to, to writing long form, writing mm-hmm. long form, uh, anyway. But I am, um, in a nutshell, I, I plot quite meticulously. Um, so I'll always know 
at least one book at a time. If I'm writing a trilogy, I might not necessarily know what's going to happen in book three, um, but I'll have some sort of idea what's going to happen in book two, and I'll, I'll have book one sort of plotted out chapter by chapter uh, from beginning to end before I, before I begin the writing process. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just if I didn't have that, it, it'd just be, I'd find it a nightmare just to try, just to try and focus every day. Where is this going? What am I doing? Um, and then you've got the added problem at the end. I think it helps with the editing process at the end. If you've, if you've got the structure down at the start, there's less problems with the structure edit at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you know, all you, you don't have to reorganize your plot threads or anything like that. Um, so yeah, basically, I, I have to put it down into small workable chunks. So I'll, I'll have the I'll have the the plot sorted, written down uh, chapter by chapter, and then even when I come to write a chapter, um, I, t- I tend to break it up down into into sort of workable beats, um, so that um, so that I know so I know where I am with it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's, you sort of staring at it, it's like, where's this going? Where, where's this chapter going to end? Um, so, it, it, and, and I, find, I find that helps with pacing um, and it helps with focus and it helps focus me on the, on, on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Writing, writing a novel is a huge, you know, it's a huge mountain to climb. It's a big commitment. Um, and it, you know, you don't, you don't, if you're climbing a mountain, you don't just uh, set off in your trainers and race to the top. You've got to take it in, you've got to take it in stages. You mean you, mean you can't just climb it in a day and, you know, you get to the top and then you can have like some water and, you know, a protein bar or something. And you're like, all right, let's, let's journey back down. We're, we're done with this one. <laughs> you need to have a rest. You need to, you need to stop at your base camps on the way, on the way up. I think I'm stretching this analogy a little bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about your books. I mean, you know, obviously we're, we're here to talk about Engine, Engines of Empire that just came out yesterday. So first off, congratulations again on, uh, on, on publication. Um, but uh, I want to ask about the, a couple of series that you've, you've already written and finished uh, prior to this one. So the first one being Steelhaven. Can you talk a little bit about that series, what it's about, uh, and, you know, kind of, kind of let the audience know, you know, what they could expect in that trilogy? Well, Steel, Steel Heaven is um, it, it's much more grimdark than I think than, than uh, Engines of Empire. It's basically about uh, all the action takes place within one city, um, and it's a city that's uh, about to go under siege. Uh, in book one, uh, we're introduced to um, a variety of different characters from from sort of different classes within within the within the city uh, from a, you know, the street kid picking pockets to, you know, the princess at the top of the, at the top of the heap. Um, and it's basically how all these points of view cross um, throughout as, as they're waiting for the siege to start. And then, you know, book two is, you know, there's a little bit more intrigue as um, the enemy tries to manoeuvre some chess pieces to be able to get access to the city and then book three is is an actual siege. When I originally when I originally pitched it, it was um it was David Gemmell's legend meets the wire. Um so basically it's it's legend, you know, David Gemmell's legend is is about the siege of um the Drostel Drostel knock. I probably got that wrong. Uh, and obviously everyone, if you haven't seen The Wire, go and see it. But the, but the, the thing that appealed to me about The Wire is that it's, it's all sorts of different characters, but it's all set in Baltimore and it's and it's how all their all their points of view sort of cross and how they influence each other. Um, so, yeah, that, that was basically what I wanted to achieve uh, with that novel. Okay. All right. And then, uh, of course, you've got the, the War of the Archon series, which uh, I know in the U.S., uh, I know the audiobooks were published by Blackstone. And you can actually get the first two books if you've got an Audible membership uh, with Audible Plus. You can actually get those first two included in your membership. So if you want to go check those out. Uh, but if you want to go in, what, what is uh, War of Archons about? Uh, well, the, the, the War of the Archons was... Um, It's difficult to explain because it's <laughs> it's quite it's quite convoluted. Um, but essentially, it starts off with a world basically where magic has disappeared for a hundred years, um, 
Um, so everyone's, you know, there, there were these huge empires that were that were run by sorcerers, and now um, now they've collapsed. Um, and at the start, um, there's a girl called Livia Harrow who manifests magical abilities for the first time, uh, and she becomes the, the she basically has a target on her back for all sorts of different people who um, who want to get some power. Want to get some power back in the world, uh, and it's basically uh, the gods are returning to seize seize power again. That's basically that in a nutshell. This is why I like to read. This is why I like to read all my book descriptions off the back of the book because that's <laughs> what this series is about. <laughs> see, but see, my point here is, is I like to put people on the spot. So you're welcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Result. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now let's let's talk about Into the Vampire. because so, I'm sure that's a little bit more uh, you know fresh <laughs> than your series. So this is uh, so this is the cover again. It just came out yesterday, the 18th, which this will have been two days ago by the time this airs. Um, but uh, it's a fantastic novel. It's got multiple points of view. Uh, I actually listened to it on audio again. I mentioned I listened to it twice because it's so good. Um, but and it's also a full cast narration. So you know if if you mm-hmm. guys enjoy narration by multiple uh you know narrators i definitely say give it a go um but first you know rich can you can you tell everybody what it's about and then we can kind of dive a little bit into it i'll give it a go uh, basically <laughs> it's a it's about family it's about the hawkspurs who are um the hawkspur guild is one of the major guilds in the nation of torwin um uh, Torwin is uh, a nation run on the power of Pyrestone. I'm trying to remember the blurb from the back of the book now. It's, it's run on the power of Pyrestone, which is a, which is basically it's a magical jewel which can be manipulated uh, by uh, mages within within the society, um, and they've developed artifice which um, basically powers powers the nation. Um, historically, they've 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 um, had a rivalry with another nation called uh, Malador, which consists of three countries, um, and it, they're split off by the Drift, which is a huge um, gaping magical desert between that runs down the middle of the continent. Uh, and basically, uh, an emissary comes from Nairakis to uh, to try and broker peace for the first time in a thousand years, uh, and then um, the trouble ensues. I mean, yeah, that's that's basically it. That's basically it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think when I did my review, I think I said it's a little bit like Elder Scrolls if it was like steampunky, uh, which right. which which I which I hope that that kind of that kind of gives a vibe. I mean, you've got you know this this fairly sprawling world. I mean, I know it's a little contained uh, within like you know the city of Torwin or the Empire of Torwin, and then uh, you know you've got a little bit in the desert, and you see a little bit outside of that. Um, but you know, then you've got all these different factions that you know you have some that are, you know, human, and you have some that are creatures, uh, and then uh, you know you've got these massive, you know, hulking like suits that uh, that are you know they're power- powered by these power stones. So I was like, yeah, steampunky Elder Scrolls sounds sounds exactly exactly like that. I'll, I'll take that. I'll t- I'll take that. I do like Elder Scrolls. It's awesome. So yeah, I, I'll I'll take that. <laughs> so what uh what was your inspiration for uh i guess for 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 tour one uh for having everything kind of uh revolve around one family uh and then uh you know kind of you know what i guess what can we expect expect going forward from from this series um well what was my influence i think i don't know i, I think i just wanted to write a story a story about family um, about responsibility um, and about, you know, what happens when family gets, gets broken apart, I guess. Um, it, it develops. The thing is, when, it, when, when I'm plotting, the world building and the plot um, sort of aren't independent. They're kind of interwoven with each other. So I spent a long time percolating the ideas for this. Uh, maybe eighteen months, two years before I, before I started writing it. So um, 
it's, it's actually difficult to say where the influences come from because they, they came from all sorts of places mm -hmm. and then they sort of amalgamated as, as, as time went on, sort of developed organically. Um, and it's it was... I, I knew that I didn't want to do sort of a straight traditional medieval fantasy setting. Um, I, I wanted something that was going to be um, just a little bit, not original, but something something different to the norm. Yeah. Um, so it's still still got guys with you know guys in armor with swords riding horses, but it's also you know it's got ten foot storm hooks and you know high storm weapons and all and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, I just I just amalgamated that and, and tried to try to see how it would organically develop, um, how society might have developed, which is where the guilds came from, um, and also what might happen if you if you had an established religion. Um, I, there were, I guess there's some real world influences for that. What happens when um, when when technology starts to become a religion rather than an actual your actual you know your actual um, ecclesiastic or, or, your, or your priest? What will happen to them? Yeah, uh, most of these things are about you know power struggles. Um, so without giving too much away. That's why that's why there's a little bit of a power struggle. Just 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 a wee bit. Yeah, and I can imagine, you know, if, if you're letting something stew for for that long, you know, you just you kind of pick up little pieces here and there. You're just like, oh, that'd be that'd be really cool. And oh, let me jot that down, kind of thing. And then eventually you're like, okay, here's everything. Now I just have to put it all together. <laughs> I've got I've got to write it. I've waited long enough. I've got to write it now. I've got to put all, I've got to put all this stuff together. And, uh, and see what happens. And, sometimes, and obviously, you, you can do as much planning as you want, but in the writing of the thing, um, certain things will develop, ideas will come to you. Um, I remember writing the original, um, I sold it on a partial, so so we, we submitted it to Orbit with a 65,000 word partial, and it ended up being 190,000 words. Um, but before I sent it, I'd, I'd sent it to my agent, and while he was looking at it, I sort of had to think again, about one of the characters, so I ended up taking one of the characters out and putting a new one, putting a new mm. one in. So even even when you you know doing the writing itself, things things can sort of crop up to throw a spanner in the works, and then you've got to re you find yourself having to rewrite sixty five thousand words, which was good in a way because I'd have hated to have written the whole thing and then think, oh, I, you know what, I need to take one of these characters out because that would have been a, a big about a huge amount of work to sort of swap out a character. Yeah, and it's not like you can just go there and just do, you know, con you know, control F and just like rename yeah. it. <laughs> just <change the> name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if only it were that easy, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, I, I know several people that have, that have you know, said certain things like that, and they're like, yeah, I had, I had to control F and just like completely find every single spot this person was mentioning. Go, okay, does it still work if I change the name? <laughs> it's like nine times out of ten, no, it does not. <laughs> no. And it changes a lot of other words as well, so you'll find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, I guess what can we what can we kind of expect to you know going forward in the age of uprising? Um, I mean, I know, I know it 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 left on a look, I don't, I don't know if I want to say it's a cliffhanger, but like it's definitely like a nice little taste of what's gonna come in the next book. Um, but I guess what what can we see going forward? Sure. Well, um, without being too spoilery. Uh, it's uh, I think the things ramp up. I guess it's certainly um, th there's. I'm, try I'm trying to think how to how to say this. You know, in a way. Um, things that you're right. Things are left on a, on a bit of a cliffhanger, um, but it, it, things get even more cliffhangery as uh, as things go on. Um, we see a little bit more of the whole the whole continent because most of it's. I mean, some of it's in in. Kana and the, which is a desert to the south, and there's the, the Sundered Isles, um, but but most of it, most of book one takes place in Torwin, um, but we're going to see a little bit more of uh, of Iberian Magna, and uh, there's a couple more. I'm, I'm adding a couple of characters who are sort of non point of view in the first book. I'm I'm sort of bringing them front and center, um, so it'll, it'll just it, everything's going to get more expansive. More murder, more betrayal, more battles, more the good stuff. <laughs> being stabbed in the back, 
yeah, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, just, more, more of it. Be more yeah, of it. just just more things like you read the first one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you like the first one, more of the same, and then like some extra. <laughs> yeah, same but, same but different. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask, you had some very interesting, uh, I guess, like creations of like creatures and so forth. You know, you had these these goat head creatures, you know, that, that, that crop up. Then you've got these giant lizard creatures and then you've got the feline type creatures. What, you know, what was it that, you know, I guess wanted you to use creatures, I guess, that we're, we know already, like instead of like creating something completely out of the, out of the norm? I, well, I like familiar, it's, if you can put something familiar in a book, even if it's, you know, sort of fantasy creature, um, if you if you make it familiar, sort of, you know, some, I mean, some writers, instead of putting horses in, they've got, you know, six-legged gormatrots or whatever you want to call it. Whereas, I, I, for me, I, I'm writing about characters, so I'm not, I'm not that bothered about, as much as your world building's got to be on point, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to um, sort of reinvent the wheel with it. So just if you want someone to ride somewhere, put them on a horse. So it's the same with, with fantasy creatures. Firstly, you've got to think about the environment. Does it make sense, you know, sort of environmentally that, that, that they'd be there? Uh, and secondly, um, just try and make them familiar. And, it's, and even with fantasy races, they're, they're going to have some human traits. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the reader's just not going to be able to connect. If, if, if something's completely alien, readers are going to struggle to connect with it, I think, for me. I certainly do. Um, so, so yeah, it was uh, it, it was important to, to keep them as familiar as possible um, and not and just not try and reinvent the wheel, I think. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting because, you, you know, you did use creatures that we're familiar with and somehow still, like, made them, a, a, like, scary. Like, not as in, like, oh, my gosh, I can't read this, but, like, you know, from like a character's perspective, like you made these things like horrifying <laughs> and, yeah, and it did a really good job, like kind of emotionally investing you in like w these characters and their, and the perils that they're facing. I think the, the Durga particularly, which is, which sort of, the, sort of the, they call them the goat heads, but they're big bull, bull sort of minotaur type beasts. Um, and they were sort of heavily influenced by uh, Warhammer Beastmen uh, without the nasty chaos bits. Um, so they so they're, they're sort of savage monsters, but they still um, they still have a society, and even that you don't see that much of it in book one, but they still have a sort of a society, and they're still able to think objectively and that, and that kind of thing. So, um, the, the, but, but they're they're only seen in book one from the point of view of of, of the of Connell and the and the armored battalion. So all, all he sees is this big savage monster that's trying to kill him. Um, whereas the, the, there's a little bit more to it than that. No spoiler. Done. Spoiler free. <laughs> um, last question I got for you: What is uh, something that you've read recently that you'd recommend? Ooh, um, I think. What have I read recently? I haven't had that much time to read. I read because I'm, I'm writing two books a year at the moment, so it's quite difficult um, to fit everything in. But uh, I think. I, I, the last book I read and really enjoyed was the second book in Joe Abercrombie's Age of Madness. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you should, I think you should read all of Joe Abercrombie's stuff. Oh I'm yeah, regardless, like a big you can, big fan. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, read a standalones, read a series. You know, <laughs> exactly industry standards. I think well, the, the people say that you just read the standalones, but I don't. I think you get a lot more out of those standalones if you've read the first three. Agreed. Because uh, there's little nods to the first three that, that add a little bit extra. Um, if, if you haven't read them, then there's, there's sort of little nods here and there that you, and, and in, in jokes and stuff like that that you just won't get. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree on, on Abercrombie. I'm actually, uh, I know you had a chat with, uh, with or I believe you, did you have a chat with Richard Swan recently or have you, have you talked to Richard Swan at all uh, about his Justice of Kings? I know. I had yeah. a chat with Bancroft about um uh 
about Babel. I miss Josiah. He, he's not on Twitter anymore. Uh, he, yeah, he's like he's like me. such a such a good fellow. Him and him and Todd A. Thompson are both off Twitter now. And like, in fact, he, left, he left soon after that interview I did with him. So I hope it wasn't anything I said. It's, it's your fault. <laughs> That's right. I'll be completely responsible for Josiah Bancroft's uh, exit. Yeah. Well, speak, speaking of Bancroft, I, mean, I, I definitely recommend uh, the books of Babel uh, if if nobody's read those or listened to them. Uh, they're fantastic. And I and I'm actually I was I was about Richard Swan because I just started his Justice of Kings. Uh, which is which is really really good. If, um, it kind of has like a little bit of like a Witcher feel in the in the beginning. I'm about a quarter of the way through, but it's yeah. It's, someone it's actually fantastic. someone someone described it as sort of a medieval Judge Dread, which which made it really appeal to me. And there's actually there's a there's a a little taster in the back of Engines of Empire, I think, of uh, of Rich's book. So okay. book, I get to read a little bit of his. There you uh, go. Taster. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, Rich, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to, to, to come and chat with me. I mean, you know, everybody, I, in my opinion, I, I really think you need to go out and read Engines of Empire. I know Rich would really appreciate it if you did or, uh, or any any of his stuff that he's got out. Um, but also, uh, Rich is going to be taking part in TBR Con next week. So uh, definitely tune in for his panel. Uh, it's it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be eight days of <laughs> of, of panels, Manage. Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yeah, I feel so bad for the moderators. I'm glad I'm not doing them all again this year. <laughs> but uh, but Rich, again, congratulations on publishing your new book. Uh, definitely <laughs> looking forward to book two, uh, and I'll see you again next week. Great, thanks for having me. Awesome, thanks. <laughs>